you, but I'm thankful to the Lord and who he is and what he does and, and uh, thankful that we have a good God. Aren't you glad for a good God? Amen. Amen. Isn't he good all the time, no matter what we're going through and what we're dealing with? And, and uh, sometimes we go through life and life seems hard, doesn't it? And it seems like you're just barely hanging in there. And that's what I'm going to be preaching about here today. And uh, so I'll turn your Bibles, if you would, to the book of Ezra, chapter number 9. We're going to look at these uh, uh, same verses. We actually, for the last two weeks, uh, last week and the week before, uh, we looked at these exact same verses. We're going to look at them again, but we're going to look at them in a different light. We're going to focus more on verse number nine uh, than we did uh, in uh, the previous messages. But uh, uh, Ezra chapter number nine, and uh, we're going to look at verses seven through nine. And so stand, if you would, to show respect to the reading of God, God's word. If you cannot, I understand you may remain seated but if we could stand and show respect as we read Ezra chapter number nine. And again, as I said, it's the same uh, verses that we've looked at. Again, just a little diff different aspect, a little different uh, light uh, is what we'll be looking at those verses here uh, today. Ezra chapter number nine, beginning there in verse number seven, it says this, since the days our fathers have, uh, have we been in a great trespass unto this day, and for our iniquities have we, our kings and our priests, been delivered into the hand of the kings of the lands uh, to the sword, to captivity and to a spoil, and to confusion of face as it is this day. And now for a little space, grace hath been showed from the Lord our God to leave us a remnant to escape and to give us a nail in, this, uh, in his holy place that uh, our God may lighten our eyes and give us a little reviving in our bondage. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Jer Judah and in Jerusalem. I entitled the message, uh, it's uh, uh, kind of a statement, uh, but uh, I entitled the message today, When You Are Just Hanging In There. When You Are Just Hanging In There. Let's go to the Lord in prayer. Our Heavenly Father, Lord, we do thank and praise you for all that you do for us. Lord, thank you for each one that's able to be here. Lord, we know there are some that uh, were sick. Lord, uh, certainly our desires to see uh, uh, folks be healed up and be able to return back with us, Lord. And uh, it's no fun being sick, Lord. We understand that. Lord, we know there are some that are, are able to be here uh, because of work and those things, Lord, we certainly understand. Lord, there are some that are not here because of spiritual sickness. Lord, uh, certainly that's something we uh, understand as well. We understand people are, are uh, hurting spiritually. They're dealing with some things spiritually. They're uh, needing to grow, Lord. Certainly that's uh, our prayer and our desire uh, for each and every person. But Lord, I pray now that your Holy Spirit would be here in this place, that you would speak to our hearts, Lord, that you would uh, challenge us and change us. And Lord, uh, certainly uh, we desire, Lord, for you uh, to encourage us and help us, Lord, in our walk with you. But Lord, I pray if there's somebody here in our midst that doesn't know you as their personal Lord and Savior, speak to their heart about their need of salvation even here today. Lord, bless your word, bless your people. Lord, I pray that uh, your word would uh, go out and accomplish that which it is sent forth to accomplish here today. Bless uh, our time together. Lord, bless your people. Uh, Lord, give us spirit-filled ears and hearts that would hear and understand the things that are uh, said here this morning. We'll be sure to give you all praise and glory for what you're about to do. In Jesus' precious name we pray and for his sake. And all of God's people said, amen. amen. Thank you. you. may be seated. When you are just hanging in there. You know, life sometimes seems unfair and, and feels as though it is overwhelming, amen? You know, sometimes we, uh, I think Brother, uh, Brother Sella was uh, 
uh, talking about this uh, a little bit as far as uh, the joy of our salvation. Sometimes we have things happen to us and we, we ask God, why? Why would you allow this? Why do, you, uh, why, are we, why do we have to go through this? Why are we having these financial problems? Why is it uh, you know, we have this uh, familia or a family problem? Whatever it may be, uh, you know, sometimes we go through things like that and we, we, uh, we think, well, you know, uh, sister so-and-so or brother so-and-so, they don't have these problems that I have and why do I have to have these problems? By the way, your problems are not unique. Now, they are unique in the sense of it's you, amen, and it's unique in the sense that it's a, a problem happening just to you, but to uh, think that you are the only one that's ever dealt with that problem, uh, that's unfair to God because uh, the Bible tells us there's nothing new under the sun, amen? There's new, no new thing under the sun. We know that things have happened. Now, again, it's a different name, different face, different problem, uh, and different family and all those different things, but, but uh, it does happen to everybody. And as unfair as it may seem and overwhelming as the problems uh, of life may seem, sometimes we, when we go through an experience, it seems as though we are just hanging on by a thread or just hanging on by a nail, you know, just, uh, you know, uh, hanging on by our, our, you know, fingernails and, you know, uh, uh, you're at the end of the rope, so to speak. And, and I always tell people, hey, tie a knot at the end of the rope, amen, and uh, hang on for dear life, amen, and and uh, sometimes we may feel that way and we feel, you know, like, uh, well, I'm just at the end of my thread. There's no other way. There's no other uh, resource I can go to. I just have to hang on to the Lord. And certainly we can do that. But you see, when God allows us to go through those trials, it is often to get the dross or impurities out of our lives and to get us to get our focus back upon him and what he has for us. Sometimes it is just so that he can be glorified. You look at the life of Job. We, we, we just but have to open up the Bible to the book of Job. And, and if you were to read the book of Job and all the things that he endured, he went through uh, uh, losing his source of income. He went through losing his, uh, uh, his children. He went through losing his health. Uh, his friends began to condemn him. His friends began to say, hey, there must be some kind of sin in your life. Otherwise, all these bad things wouldn't be happening to you. To, uh, happening to you. Even his wife and I, 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 I feel sorry for her, but, uh, and, and I certainly don't condemn her and what she said, but even uh, uh, Job's wife said to him, hey, you know, Job, just curse God and die. Just get it over with. Amen? Such a loving wife, but I, I understand kind of her, her you know, uh, uh, her dilemma because she had lost, ten, you know, 10 of her children. I, I've lost four, and I, you know, it was devastating to our family, my wife and I, just losing four. I can't imagine losing ten all at once, all in the same day. I can't imagine that. But God desires for him to be glorified and for us to get our focus upon him. And though we feel or think that we are at the end of our resources, we must never forget that God is ultimately in control. And there are some things that we can learn uh, when we are just hanging in there. Today, I've got uh, just six things that hopefully will be a help and encouragement to each of you. First of all, number one, know this, God won't abandon you. God won't abandon you. I'm glad we sang that song, Great is Thy Faithfulness. God is faithful, amen? He's faithful no matter what we go through. Look back at our text there in verse number nine. He says, for we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. Yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage. You know, I'm so glad that God took care of the children of Israel, even when they were in bondage, even when they were in Babylon. Remember, they were there because of their own sin. They were there because of their own, of their own making, of their own doing. That's the reason why they were there, Amen. However, God never once said, all right, that's it. I'm turning my back on you. I don't want to take care of you. No, God took care of them the entire time. He never forsook them. I'm glad we have verses. Keep your finger there in Ezra. We'll come back to here in just a moment. But I'm glad we have uh, verses like uh, in Hebrews. Turn with me to the book of Hebrews and chapter number 13. Hebrews chapter number 13 
certainly uh, there are some things that we can learn uh, from the entire book of Hebrews, but, but I want you to notice uh, in this particular verse that we're going to be looking at, verse number five, it's still true today. Hebrews chapter number 13, verse number five says, let your conversation be without covetousness and be content with such things as you have. For he hath said, I will what? Never leave thee, nor what? Nor forsake thee. You know, I'm so glad we have a promise in God's word that uh, tells us, you know, God, that's by the way, that's God telling us, I'll never leave you and I'll never forsake you. Aren't you glad for that? You know, uh, sometimes, we, as I said, we may feel like we're alone but, and we may feel overwhelmed, but, but uh, and God, by the way, God may bring you to the backside of the desert so that you may get rid of your uh, excess baggage that, you've been, that maybe has been uh, slowing you down spiritually and, and so that you can get your focus upon him. But I, I'm so glad to know that God doesn't forsake us. Too many people think that God has forgotten them and left them there to waste away. It wasn't like God all of a sudden said, hey, I'm going to put you in this trial and say, oh, oh my goodness, where, where did I put this person? Amen. You ever done that? You, you set something down and you're like, oh man, where did I put this? And you're searching around and you're like, oh, my stars, I know I put it here somewhere. And, and you have it in your pocket the whole time. Amen. And you're like, oh, there it is. I, I knew I had them. Amen. <laughs> I've done the same thing. But you know, God isn't like that. He's not like, where, where, did, I, where did I put that person? I I thought I put him in some kind of a trial, but I can't remember which one it was. Amen? I'm glad God knows exactly where we're at. He knows exactly uh, uh, what we're dealing with. And God is trying to sanctify you and I, his people. He's trying to make us a cleaner people for him. You see, even in the wilderness, we mentioned about the children of Israel being in the wilderness. Even in the wilderness, God never forsook them. God took care of them. Remember they said, oh, we're thirsty. Remember they get out in the, well, first they get to the uh, uh, Red Sea and they're like, oh, you brought us out here to die. God says, all right, don't worry about it. I got this. He makes a way for them to go across the Red Sea. Isn't that amazing? Amen. Just a miracle of that alone just blows my mind. Dry ground. They didn't have to worry. I've often thought of wondering, I, I, this is Pastor Hallett doctrine. I have no proof of this, but I often think that the children probably would walk along and see the fish. Hey, Dad, look at, hey, boy, son, we're, we're leaving. No, Dad, Dad, there's a fish there, amen? Can you imagine that? <laughs> I've often thought the different things that they saw as they're crossing the Red Sea, amen? They get across on dry ground. God took care of them. Then they get into the wilderness and, and they said, oh, oh, we're thirsty. God says, all right, I got this, Amen. God never forsook them. Yes, they were disobedient. Yes, they were in the wilderness because of their unbelief and because of their disobedience, amen. But God never forsook them. When they were uh, hungry, what did God do? Oh, you big babies, you gotta go get some food yourselves. No, he didn't do that. Matter of fact, he said, hey, I'll give you manna. All you have to do is gather it. Can you imagine going out every single day and gathering the food for that day, amen? Amen. Well, that'd be pretty nice, wouldn't it? You wouldn't have to, the grocery bill would be uh, just nil, amen? It'd be nothing. Nowadays, you, you buy two items and you spend $100. You're like, what in the world, you know? <laughs> but you and I realize that God took care of them. By the way, they even got to the point where they said, oh, we don't want manna, we want meat. <laughs> amen? There were, there were men that were, I, I guarantee you that was the men that was crying for the meat. That wasn't the ladies. That was a man, oh, we need meat, oh, steak. God said, all right, I'll give you something close to steak, amen. Quail, amen. He gave them so much quail, they even got to the point where they're like, oh, this is too much. But you see, God never forsook them. And listen carefully, that is the lesson that we can learn here from the book of Ezra. Even though uh, they were in this situation because of their own doing, God had not forsaken them in their, in their uh, bondage. God won't abandon you. Number one, we see God won't abandon you. Number two, something else we see. We see God's application of mercy. When you're just hanging in there, we see God's application of mercy. Look back at our text there, Ezra chapter number nine. And notice again, verse number nine. It says there, it says, but God hath extended mercy unto us 
but God hath extended mercy unto us. You know, I'm so glad that God was merciful to the children of Israel, amen? He didn't just all of a sudden say, all right, that's it, you're done, I, I'm gonna wipe you off the face of the earth. Matter of fact, there was one time he did that, and even Moses said, hold on, Lord, hold on. I, I, these people are worth saving, amen? There are a few times Moses was like, yeah, kill them, Lord, just kill them, amen? But not that time, he's like, whoa, 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 hold on, Lord, don't kill them, Amen? I'm so glad that God is a merciful God. You see, when you cry out to him for mercy, he, uh, he will many times give it to you. Look with me, if you will. Keep your finger there again in Ezra. We'll, uh, we'll look at it again. But uh, Psalm chapter number 59. Psalm chapter number 59. And in Psalm chapter number 59, I want you to notice with me there verse number 16. Psalm chapter number 59 and verse number 16. This particular psalm is a uh, psalm of David, and uh, he, uh, uh, of course, is writing about God's mercy, and uh, 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 even in verse number, actually it's mentioned a couple times in this particular passage, I think it's verse number 10, it says the God of my mercy uh, shall prevent me, uh, God shall let me uh, see my desire upon mine enemies. Then we skip down to verse number 16, which is what we were going to look at. He says, but I will sing of thy power. Yea, I will sing aloud of thy mercy in the morning, for thou hast been my defense and refuge in the day of my trouble. You know, I'm so glad that David learned uh, of God's mercy. Amen. It just proves to us that God can be merciful to us even in our times of, of uh, ignorance and even in our times of sin. Yeah, I'm glad for God's mercy. Look in Lamentations chapter number uh, three. Lamentations chapter number three. Lamentations chapter number three, and I want you to notice with me there verse number 22 and 23. It says, it is of the Lord's mercies that we are not consumed because his compassions fail not they are new every morning. Great is thy faithfulness. You know, God's mercy is renewed every single day. Amen. And his mercy that he gave to us yesterday will be fresh and new today. Amen. By the way, when you're in distress, learn to call on the Lord. Look in Psalm chapter number four. Psalm chapter number four. Problem with a lot of Christians, they think they can get themselves out of their problem and out of their situation. And God just wants us to call upon him. In Psalm chapter number four, I want you to notice uh, in verse number one, it says this, hear me when I call, O God of my righteousness, thou hast enlarged me when I was in distress, have mercy upon me and hear my prayer. I'm so glad that we can cry out for God's mercy, aren't you? You see, God will give you his mercy, though you are undeserving of it at all. You know, none of us deserve God's mercy, amen? All of us deserve uh, God's judgment, do we not, amen? All of us deserve, by the way, God's, uh, not only his judgment, but God's, uh, 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 as far as, uh, you know, Christianity is concerned, we deserve hell, amen? That's what we deserve. But God in his mercy, he's willing to say, all right, I'm not going to, uh, you know, there were a couple of times you look at, at David and, and his life and as a matter of fact, uh, a number of different people, even the children of Israel, God uh, in his mercy spared uh, the children of Israel. God in his mercy spared David because of his, uh, proper, their proper response. And you and I need to have a proper response to the Lord. Oh, we see there though the, uh, the application, God's application of mercy. Number one, when you're just hanging in there, uh, number one, God won't abandon you. Number two, we see God's application of mercy. Number three, we see God's spiritual awakening. We see God's spiritual awakening. Look back in our text there, Ezra chapter number nine again. Ezra chapter number nine. Again, looking at verse number nine. It says, but hath extended mercy unto us. Uh, I'm going to back up the beginning of the verse. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving. To give us a reviving. You know, God wanted to revive the hearts of the children of Israel. 
And God wants to do the same to you. God wants to revive your heart. The problem is many times, many Christians, most Christians out there say, don't want to be revived. Amen? Um, there's a, a thing uh, that at most hospitals, uh, they have a thing called a DNR. And I've had some people, uh, uh, just had an individual I was talking to, uh, I believe it was either yesterday or, or the day before. And uh, this individual said, you know, I'm in my 90s. And uh, they said, you know, if something happens to me, I've told them uh, to put a DNR on me. And that means do not resuscitate. And that's a hard thing. You know, I've, we've had, uh, as a pastor, I've had many different uh, church members that have had uh, physical ailments or in a hospital, whatever. And, uh, you know, the person says or requests a DNR, meaning they do not want to be resuscitated. And that's hard as a family member because you want to see your, you know, your loved one live for a lot longer, amen? There was uh, one individual, they were in their 80s, if I remember correctly, and they had a DNR put on them and had uh, uh, the family, uh, really, this individual got, ended up being put on life support and the family uh, wanted to go against what that person's wishes were. And I said, I said to the family, I was very blunt, very, uh, you know, and I said, look, I, I'm not this person and I'm not, uh, you know, I'm not your family. I'm just simply this person's pastor. But I will tell you this, this is what their request is. And I think you need to honor that. And I said, as hard as it may be, I said, you have to honor that person's request. I said, uh, that's their decision that uh, they made a long time ago when they were you know, cognizant and, and uh, cognizant, I'm sorry, and uh, able to make that uh, decision. But as Christians, we need to realize God wants to revive our life and, and some aren't willing uh, uh, and don't desire to be revived. Some aren't willing to get away from Satan and his snares. Sadly, many Christians will believe uh, the proficient liar uh, of, uh, and lies of Satan and ignore our sufficient Lord. They'll just say, well, you know, I, I think what Satan sounds, you know, it sounds pretty good. By the way, we know that Satan is a, a uh, he's an angel of light, the Bible tells us. Amen? So there's always going to be a little amount of truth with, uh, with the lies that he spreads. Amen? It's like this. Uh, uh, if you were to look at uh, Decon, I don't know if they still make it. I assume they do. But Decon is a, uh, it's a, a, a poison to kill mice and rats and all those different rodents. And uh, uh, the thing about it, if you look, were to look at the instructions or the ingredients of decon, it used to say, and I don't know if it still says this, but it used to say 99.0%, uh, 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 and then it would say whatever. And, uh, or usually, I think it was said 99.9% .9 is what it said. And then it would say 0.1% arsenic. I don't know if it still does that, you know, say that or if they still use that, but that's what it used to say. That 0.1% of arsenic, everything else, 99.9% .9 of it is good. If you were to look at it, it talks about all these different uh, uh, things that uh, if, if you and I were to eat those things, it'd be okay. But guess what? That 0.1% arsenic is the poison. Amen. And that's exactly what Satan does. He'll, he'll include a bunch of truth and then he'll, uh, he'll, he'll just have that 0.1% of arsenic, that 0.1% uh, of poison that he'll tell you why. He doesn't want you to grow spiritually. He wants you to be on the wayside. He doesn't want you to go forward. He doesn't want you to rebuild. He doesn't want you uh, ever to be revived. But God may allow your uh, boat to be rocked in order for you to experience revival. And unfortunately, many hearts are not revived because uh, some people don't uh, want God to rock their boat. And you need to just turn your boat around and follow Christ and uh, uh, be willing to say, hey, uh, if God wants me to go upstream, I'll just follow him upstream. Amen. You and I as God's children need to be willing to say, Lord, I want to be uh, spiritually awakened. I want to be spiritually revived. Oh, we see there, uh, number three, we see God's spiritual awakening. Number one, as far as when you are just hanging in there, number one, God won't abandon you. Number two, we see God's application of mercy. Number three, we see God's spiritual awakening. 
Number four, we see God's arrangement. We see God's arrangement. Look back in our text there. And notice again what he says. He says, for we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the king of Persia to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God. To set up the house of our God. You know, uh, God had given instructions, clear instructions on how to set things up and set things in order. And uh, we're not going to go there for the sake of time. But if you were to look at the book of Leviticus, uh, uh, that is talking about the Le- uh, the Levites. They were to have certain things. But even in the book of Exodus, Exodus and Leviticus deals with a lot of the different things, uh, what they were supposed to wear, how they were supposed to behave themselves uh, uh, when they were in uh, the temple, how they were supposed to uh, make sure certain things were a certain way and, and all that. Boy, I'm glad, by the way, we don't have to do that. Amen. Aren't you glad for that? Amen. But we need to realize that God many times will do a work. And God, when he does a work, he'll add to the church in times of trouble. You know, when people are just hanging in there by a nail, they tend to turn to God. I've watched uh, uh, people, uh, you know, that I thought, well, you know, uh, all right. I just kind of thought, well, this person's done. And I've had people uh, call me and said, Pastor, I need your help. I mean, I've had people that, you know, the last time I had talked with them, they're like, I hate you. I don't ever want to see you again. And yet when trouble comes, who do they turn to? Pastor Hallett, I need your help. Okay. All right. Hey, I love you. Hey, I'm praying for you. Hey, I want to see God's best for you. Amen. You know, we've watched God as he continued to, has continued to rebuild the, the work here at Birch Street Baptist Church. We've watched God do a, a great work that only he can get glory and honor for. Turn with me real quick like to uh, Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. Ephesians chapter number four. And look with me, if you will, at verse number 16. Ephesians chapter number four and verse number 16. It says, from, uh, from whom the whole body fitly joined together, compacted by that which every joint supplieth, according to the effectual working in the measure of every part, maketh increase of the body unto the edifying of itself in love. You know, we need to realize God has uh, brought all of us here. You know, I, I, I'm amazed at the motley crew of people that we have here at Birch Street, Birch Street Baptist Church. Amen. We have folks that uh, uh, have white collar jobs. We have people that have blue collar jobs. We have people that uh, are business owners. We have people that, uh, uh, you know, have uh, uh, experience in various, uh, uh, you know, vast many uh, uh, different uh, uh, jobs and and things like that. And, And God has brought us all here together, knitted us together. Amen. Are we a perfect people? No, we're an imperfect church led by an imperfect pastor, amen? (laughs) But it's amazing how God has perfectly fit us together and brought us together. And, uh, you know, it's amazing how the different stories of how God brought many people here, amen? It's encouraging uh, just to watch what God is doing and how God is working. And and we have to be willing to to say, okay, Lord, I'm gonna let you do that work that only you can do. Look with me, if, if you will, at 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12. 1 Corinthians chapter number 12, and and look with me, if you will, at verse number 12. First Corinthians chapter number 12 and verse number 12, and then we're gonna skip down to verse number 25. In verse number 12, it says, for as the body is one and hath many members and all the members of that one body, being many are one body, so also is Christ. Now I'll go down to verse number 25. That there uh, should be no schism or imperfection in the body, but that the members should have the same care one for another. You know, we ought to care for each other, Amen. The problem with a lot, of, a lot of Christians, they get to the point where they say, well, I don't care about this person. I don't care about, I don't care. No, 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 no. You got a wrong attitude if that's your attitude. Amen? You ought to care about somebody. 
You ought to care about where they're at spiritually. You ought to care about uh, where they're at uh, physically. You ought to care if they're not here in the house of God. You ought to care you know, where, uh, if they're reading their Bible or not. You ought to care if they're coming to church uh, faithfully or not. Amen? You ought to care. You know, God wants you uh, to, to care for one another. And God wants you to be involved. He wants you to, to do your part, whether it's uh, uh, the planting or the watering, but, but he'll, uh, he'll bring the crops in, amen? We have to be willing to say, Lord, I'll do my part. I'll do what I can. You know, I'll, I'll be a witness, whether it's, uh, by the way, uh, I, it's been a few weeks here since I've encouraged you, but I want to encourage you, grab some gospel tracts, amen? Before you leave, grab five or six of them, Amen? Then ask the Lord this week, Lord, would you give me an opportunity to share with somebody, again, somebody new, somebody haven't ha handed one out. If you say, well, I've handed this person five of them, quit handing that person out, okay? And hand it to somebody else, amen? But then watch what God will do. You never know how God will use that one gospel tract. If you'll ask the Lord, Lord, would you help me to share the gospel with somebody and watch what God will do. I've seen people get saved as a result of gospel tracts. Amen? Uh, I know of uh, one gospel tract that I handed out. There was about uh, 10 people that got saved from that gospel tract. My parents figured out one time there was a gentleman, they gave, uh, my dad gave a gospel tract to a gentleman. He was a drunk. He, to my knowledge or to their knowledge, he never got saved. My dad had given him a gospel tract and said, hey, would you sober up? Would you take time to read this? He went to his sister's house, uh, took it out of his pocket, set it on the uh, counter. He did not read it. To their knowledge, he didn't get saved. But his sister read it. His sister got saved. Her husband read it. Her husband got saved. And as a result, there was about 100 people or so. They think there might have been a little over 100, but at least 100 people that they could count that they knew exactly because of that one tract and that, uh, that family getting saved, there was 100 people that got saved. You say, well, what does it matter? It matters, amen? It could mean 100 people getting saved if you're just willing to say, hey, Lord, I'll do my part. I'll, re I'll, I'll do what I can to help rebuild this church. Even, even the Lord said in Matthew chapter number 16, verse number 18, I say, I say also unto thee that thou art Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gates of hell will, uh, shall not prevail against it. I'm so glad to know that we have a God that, that uh, won't allow the gates of hell to, hell to prevail against this church, Amen. But will you allow God to rebuild you and grow you? You see, that's God's arrangement. He wants to rebuild you. Oh, we see there, uh, number four, God's arrangement. Number one, as far as when you're just hanging in there, number one, God won't abandon you. Number two, we see God's application of mercy. Number three, we see God's spiritual awakening. Number four, we see God's arrangement. Number five, we see God's achievement. We see God's achievement. Look back in our text there. Back in Ezra in chapter number nine. Ezra chapter number nine. And again, notice what he says there. For we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof. And to repair the desolations thereof. You know, God wanted the children of Israel to repair the temple there in Jerusalem, amen? They had to rebuild it. They had to uh, take time to uh, get down to the foundation and, and do all the different repairs that had to be done. And you and I need to realize that God has many times tried to rebuild and trying to repair our own lives, Amen. God's trying to do that work in our life. God would like to repair and rebuild your life if you but would just let him. The problem is that some Christians don't want him to repair it or to rebuild it, or uh, you would do your best to repair to rebuild it yourself and then really mess it up. You know, I've seen a lot of Christians where they say, well, I'll just get myself out of this problem. No, 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 you'll mess things up, amen? God has a blueprint for your life and you have to be willing to follow it. Look in the book of Isaiah, Isaiah chapter number six. Isaiah chapter number six. And I want you to notice there with me, beginning in verse number 10. Isaiah chapter number six. Of course, uh, if you were to look at this uh, uh, chapter, it's about Isaiah and uh, 
how he sees the Lord and, and uh, he says, hey, here am I, send me. And then uh, you come to verse number uh, 10, he, uh, actually in verse number nine, uh, and he said, go and tell this people, hear ye indeed, but understand not, and see ye indeed, but perceive not. Make the heart of this people fat and make their uh, ears heavy and shut their eyes, lest they see with their eyes and hear with their ears and understand with their heart and convert and be healed. Then said I, Lord, how long? And he answered until the cities be wasted without inhabitant and the houses without man and the land be utterly desolate. He said, hey, you do this until there's nobody else left. Amen. And you and I need to be willing to say, Lord, would you do a repair in my life, Lord, until, until, uh, there's, uh, until you decide to take me home? Amen. You see, God wants to repair the problems in your life. He wants to rebuild the broken down areas in your life. He wants to take the problems that make life bumpy and make it smoother. We know that from the book of Isaiah in chapter number 61. Turn there with me if you would. Isaiah chapter number 61. We're almost done. Isaiah chapter number 61. And notice there verse number one, and then we'll skip down to verse number four. The spirit of the Lord God is upon me because the Lord hath anointed me to preach good tidings unto the meek and he hath sent me to bind up the broken heart to, to proclaim liberty to the captives and the opening of the prison to them that are bound. Then all the way down to verse number four and they shall build the old waste and they shall raise up uh, the former desolations and they shall repair the waste cities, the desolations of many generations. You know, you and I need to be willing to say, Lord, would you do that work in my life? Lord, would you help me to uh, help others, reach others, Lord, that they can uh, have their lives rebuilt by you? You see, God can take all your problems and make them work together for good. We know that from Romans chapter number eight, verse 28, amen? You see, God can take Humpty Dumpty and put all the pieces of your life back together again. You may say, well, my life is shattered. That's all right. Bring it to the Lord. God can take all those different pieces and bring them together. And, you know, uh, uh, there have been times where I thought, oh, man, Lord, there's no way this, uh, this life is ever going to be put back together. And then uh, you have to wait sometimes on the Lord. Amen. Sometimes you have to be patient. God's timing is not our timing. You know, we, as I said, we live in an instant world and we think, uh, uh, well, you know, everything has to be instantly put back together. Look with me, if you will, at Psalm chapter number 27. Psalm chapter number 27. And in Psalm chapter number 27, I want you to notice with me there, verse number 14. Notice what he says there. Psalm chapter number 27, verse number 14. says, wait on the Lord. Be of good courage and he shall strengthen thine heart. Wait, I say, on the Lord. You know, sometimes we don't want to, we don't want to wait, do we? We want everything to be instant. You know, uh, uh, we, uh, you want to, uh, just the other day I had, uh, uh, we, we had some breakfast sandwiches. They're, they're a croissant sandwich. And uh, we had some and, and I told my wife, I said, hey, I kind of hung, I got a hankering for that. And, and so she said, okay, I'll make, I'll make one real quick. And, and uh, uh, so she made it and, and uh, uh, just a couple of minutes, however long it's in the microwave and boom, it's hot and melty and good and tasty and all that. And there's a new, uh, I call it noodles. My kids call it, uh, I think my wife calls it soup and I don't know what my kids call it. They just call it good, amen. We came across these noodles. We were at uh, uh, Family Dollar and we found out that they actually, uh, or Dollar Tree, and we found out they sell it at, uh, um, at Woodman's a lot cheaper uh, even than Dollar Tree. And uh, if you like spicy noodles, I'm just gonna give a free, uh, I don't even know what it's called. It's uh, uh, wasabi or something, or I don't remember what it's called. But anyways, it's uh, some kind of a noodle that is hot. And spi we're talking about spicy hot. I like spicy things, Amen. And uh, it only takes, I think it's about four minutes. You put some water in, it goes up to a certain level where, you know, if you put a little less water, then there'd be no water in there. If you put a little more water, it'll be more like soup and all that if you want it that way. But it is spicy and it is good, amen? I had it for supper last night. Four minutes and I had my supper, amen? But you know what? God doesn't work that way. God isn't going to do something in four minutes. Now, he may, 
Amen? He certainly can. But sometimes we have to say, Lord, would you do the rebuilding? By the way, the rebuilding of our life, it's not going to just take four minutes. Amen? You messed it up, it took you a lot longer than four minutes to mess it up. Amen? It's going to take you a lot longer to put, put all the pieces back together. But listen carefully, there's still hope. God can still bring those pieces back together. Let me ask you this. What has God done in your life? Will you wait on the Lord and allow him to achieve something great in and through you? Oh, we see there God's achievement. Number one, when you're just hanging in there, number one, God won't abandon you. Number two, we see God's application of mercy. Number three, we see God's spiritual awakening. Number four, we see God's arrangement. Number five, we see God's achievement. And lastly, number six, we see God's access. We see God's access. Look back at our text there, Ezra chapter number nine. Ezra chapter number nine. Notice with me quickly there again in verse number nine. It says, but we were bondmen, yet our God hath not forsaken us in our bondage, but hath extended mercy unto us in the sight of the kings of Persia to give us a reviving, to set up the house of our God and to repair the desolations thereof and to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. And to give us a wall in Judah and in Jerusalem. You know, the children of Israel had to have uh, walls. It's a uh, defense. In, in the, the days back then, you know, we, uh, today we have houses, you know. Uh, I'm praising the Lord. We have some walls here in the building, amen. We have a roof over our head. I was watching a video last, uh, last night or this last week or whatever it was about this guy that went through, a, a, I think it's called a Draco or something like that, a Drecho, uh, but it's a, a storm that uh, has consistent uh, um, uh, winds for a long time and, and it's kind of like a hurricane, only it's on land. It seems like a tornado, but it's on land. And this kid, he was in this, uh, uh, in this shop and he's doing this video and he's watching the roof and the roof is, I mean, it's a metal roof and the roof is bouncing like this and all of a sudden the roof gets tore off He's literally in this bathroom. He closed the bathroom door. There's water leaking in. I'm like, oh my stars. This kid must have been thinking he was about to die. And then he showed a video. It was literally a room about this small right here. He was in that room and God had protected him during that time. The rest of the building was gone. I mean, it was just in shambles and in pieces everywhere. But there he was in that one little spot. I was like, hmm. Isn't that like life? Life may be blowing around and we may be concerned about the storm that's right there by us. But God has us in that safe little haven that says, hey, wait a second. No, you have access directly to me and I'll take care of this, amen? There ought to be walls, by the way, in your life but these walls must have gates. You see, to keep, uh, you want to have gates to be able to keep the wrong things out but you also want to have gates so that you can let the right things in. You see, God must have full access to all of your heart and life, though. You must be willing to say, Lord, I, I'm here. and The storm is blowing around me, but Lord, I'm right here. I want you to have complete access to this room, this uh, access to my life, and Lord, to my heart. Lord, would you do a work in my life and my heart? You see, you cannot keep them out of you uh, out if you are to be filled with this Holy Spirit and your life is to become pleasing to him. You, you, uh, God cannot have access if you are pushing against him. If you keep uh, pushing against the Holy Spirit and say, no, 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 God will finally say, all right, that's it. By the way, Christian, I've been in that place. That's an awful place to be at. I don't want any of you to ever be in that place. I want you to avoid that place, amen? I want you to be to the point where you say, hey, Lord, would you do work in my life? But you see, God has to have complete access to your life. Oh, does the Lord have complete access to your life? So let me ask you this. Are you just hanging in there? Does it seem as though all in your life is going awry and there is nowhere to turn? Then turn to God. He will not abandon you and his mercy awaits you. He wants you to awaken to your, uh, your, uh, your heart spiritually to where you're at spiritually now. He desires that your heart be revived. He has arranged each person here at Birch Street Baptist Church so that we might grow as a whole. And he will achieve great things in your life if you'll let him. 
but you must give him full access in your life. Or are you just hanging in there? Then won't you come to the Lord today? Let's bow our heads for prayer. Every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I'm gonna ask just a couple of quick questions and we'll have a hymn of invitation. I wanna invite you to come and talk to the Lord. Come and do business with him. Perhaps you're here today and say, Pastor, I, I don't know if I'm saved. I'm not 100% sure if heaven's my eternal home. If I were to die today, I don't know where I'll spend eternity, but I'd like to know. My prayer for you will not save you, but I would like the privilege to pray for you. If you're like that here today, you'd say, Pastor, that's me. I don't know where I'll spend eternity, but I'd like to know. Would you pray for me? I'll not call you out. I'll not embarrass you in any way, form, or fashion, but I'd like to pray for you. If you're like that, you say, Pastor, that's me. Would you indicate that need just by slipping your hand up and slip it back down? I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. Pastor, pray for me. I don't know if I'm saved. I don't know where I'll spend eternity, but I'd like to know. Would you pray for me? The other question then is this. You say, Pastor, I know I'm saved. I'm on my way to heaven. But I realize, I realize I've been just kind of living life like I'm just hanging in there. Life's been tough. It's been unfair. But God has spoken to my heart during the message today. Pastor, in this brief prayer, would you pray for me? Would you indicate that need just by slipping your hand up and slipping back down? I'll see your hand. God knows your heart's need. Yes, thank you and thank you. Boy, there are hands all over this auditorium here today. Thank you. We slip them down. Anybody else? Yes, I see that one as well. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to my heart. Would you pray for me? Is anybody else like that here? Yes, I see that hand. I see this hand over here. See this one over here and this one back there and this one over here. This one in the middle here. Yes, thank you. We slip them down. Anybody else? Pastor, pray for me. God spoke to my heart. Would you pray for me? In just a moment, we're going to have a hymn of invitation. I want to invite you to come and talk with the Lord. Come and do business with him. You know, we can come to the Lord in prayer. You can use these steps as an old-fashioned altar, and you can talk with him. I'm glad we have direct access to him. Won't you come and talk with him today? Won't you come? Heavenly Father, thank you for speaking to hearts. Bless now this invitation time. Lord, I pray you be glorified through it. In Jesus' name we pray. Amen. Everyone stand to their feet, every head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. If God's spoken to heart, I want to encourage you to come. Let's hit